Did you grow up wanting to be an actor? Yes, actually, from what I remember. Yeah, uh, well, the thing is, I actually started doing theater when I was seven. So yeah, I was taking theater arts outside of school, just like on the weekends, weeknights. I was part of a group and I was in productions and whatnot. And then I started doing that all through high school as well. And then I actually went to theater school in New York City. So, but radios kind of started before that when I was still in high school. I actually had my first radio show at CIUT 89.5, the UFT station in Toronto. So going back to the acting, you know, when I was in high school and I was, you know, part of all these productions and I just, you know, I have a passion for it. I love it so much. But I was at that age where I was thinking, okay, you know, where's this going to lead me? Do I really want to be an actress? I don't know. Let's be more realistic type of thing. So I said, well, what's similar? What's something similar that I would be good at? And I thought, okay, maybe like TV or radio. So I got into a program where I had a placement at the U of T station for radio and I ended up really loving it. And I eventually got asked to work there and I had my own show there when I was 18, when I was still in high school. It was an independent show. I interviewed like independent artists and bands and whatnot. It was during the day. And then I found out about this acting school in New York. Like I thought, oh my gosh, this is, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. I auditioned. I flew down to audition and I got in. So I said, I have to go. So I went and it was great. I was in New York City for two years studying theater. And then I decided to move back to Toronto. I don't know why. I would go back and forth, back and forth to New York. So tell me about the New York experience because you went to the American School of Dramatic Arts. That's like being on the TV show Fame. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a lot of people like would say that. Like, is that Juilliard? I'm like, no, but similar. Yeah, that's exactly kind of how it felt. It was like even like the old building, you know, and the studios that we would have our classes in. We'd have all types of classes. We'd have, you know, vocal production, which is singing and which I was terrible at. I'm, I don't like singing. I was trained to do it, but it's not my thing. I just, yeah, I'd rather do other things. Obviously, we had like dance and voice and speech and everything. So that experience was amazing. I loved it. It was better than I thought. And the training I got was amazing. And just living in New York City at such a young age, I think I moved there when I was 19 years old. So living on my own in New York after graduating high school was a pretty big deal. (laughs) But you've got to have some pretty, I mean, today's parents, there's a lot of helicopter parents out there that just would never think of letting their 19 year old go to live in New York. And that's so by today's standards. So your parents must have been, what were they? Yeah, I guess they were very supportive. I guess you would say that. That's for sure. Very supportive. So I mean, I think I remember my dad being super emotional about it, like after when they left me and I was like, "Woo, this is exciting. But yeah, it was it was just definitely like a no brainer for me and for them, you know, something I had to do and experience. So and I'm really glad I did. I think I'd be a completely different person now if I didn't do that. Do you remember who wrote your reference letter? (laughs) No, I don't. I have no idea. I just remember auditioning and that's it. And I don't even remember what my monologues were. I don't remember any of that. It was a kind of a while ago now. I don't want to age myself here, but it was kind of, it was a while ago. So I'm unfamiliar with the school. So I went and checked and by today's standards, you need two reference letters to get in. One's a dramatic one and one's a personal one. Yeah, I probably had someone in my family and then maybe like an acting teacher or something. I honestly don't remember who they were. And then you went back to Toronto afterwards? And what happened next? And then, you know, I was kind of auditioning. I just said, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll just audition. I'll get an agent. And I'll, I'll go back to school to, you know, work on getting my degree. Because why not? But I don't know. I don't think that was really good for me because I felt as though just taking a course in university that's just general was not for me. I mean, for some people, it's great. But I feel like I have to, you know, specialize in something. <laughs> so. I did that for a bit and it was good, but there was a point where I remember I was listening to the radio because like I said, I started radio before and I was like, oh, I miss that. I'm like, that's, that's me. That's my job. Like, you know, I was like getting to the point where I was getting like angry listening because I, I felt like I was supposed to be doing that. So I thought about it and I was like, well, why don't I just do it again? And I just decided to uh, apply for a radio broadcasting program at the one at Seneca at York and I got in. And I was like, okay. And once I decided to do that, I said, this is exactly where I'm going. This is exactly what I'm doing. There's no turning back. And yeah. And what are those favorite radio stations in Toronto you were listening to that you said, I want to be there? 
I think at the time, definitely was 102.1 The Edge. I've always been a fan of that station. I think definitely that one. Yeah, I'm going to say that one is the main one because I know like since then it's changed. And the Seneca experience was a positive one. And I'm going to assume it was because we'll get into it in a sec because I think you're teaching there too. I am. Yes. Yeah, it was a very positive experience. I had a great time. I actually, I kind of fast tracked it. So I did it in a year and a half where I just like went straight through the summer, which was good because I was not there to waste time. And I made a lot of really good friends. And yeah, I found the, the experience really, really good. So I already had a little bit of experience in radio. So I kind of knew where I was going with that and like what I wanted to get out of it. You know, and I, I knew I wanted to be on air because I had that experience before. I knew like this is my passion. Like when I first time I sat in front of a board at school, I was like, okay, this is my this is my environment. You know, I already felt super comfortable. Also, I like was really interested in the music side of things as well. But yeah, so I did that, and then I had my first internship at Chum. So I did that, and I was working in the creative department, a bit of production, and then from there. This is the kind of the advice I give to my students because yes, I do teach part-time also at Seneca. I always say, you know, because everyone has to intern to get a certain amount of hours to graduate. Once you graduate, if you know, if you're still interning somewhere, ask if you can still keep going, you know, if you can just keep going to your internship because once you leave school and you leave a radio station, you have nothing left to hold on to in a, in a way. Like, yes, you can apply to certain places. You can do this and that. But once you're in the door, you're there. And so whether you're making money or not, you're still making those connections. You're still building those relationships. You're still learning new things. You're still in the building. So go work for free or do whatever you have to do for free until you find your first job. So that was my advice. Because that's exactly what I did. I said, can I just keep coming here? Like I've graduated. They're like, sure. So I would go every single day because I was free. And I would just apply, apply, apply to jobs until I got something. And then that was it. Was there any pressure given by Seneca to look outside of Toronto for work? Not so much pressure, but encouragement. Definitely. Because I mean, the industry is so small in a sense where, you know, there's only a handful of on-air people within the country, let alone just Toronto. So they encourage you to go make your mistakes elsewhere, learn everything, hone your craft, whether it's a year or two years, whatever it may be, then come back to Toronto, right? Because if you make all your big mistakes in a large market, then where do you go from there? You know? So yeah, it was definitely encouraged. And also too, just with your experience, I mean, realistically getting a job in Toronto right away is, is very rare. Has that changed today with the students that you work with? I mean, it's always encouraged that you could do that, but is it as necessary as it once was? So that's interesting because I do think it is still necessary, but I feel like our market has expanded so much. So now that the smaller radio stations in like Kitchener or London or Barrie are not as far away as they once were. Do you know what I mean? Because the GTA, Toronto, everything is expanding so much. So those small radio stations are not that small anymore. So yes and no, yes, go outside of Toronto, but you don't really have to go that far anymore. You don't have to go to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan if you don't want to, you know? I think there's a lot of opportunity within reach. Yeah, I smirked a little bit because you said Kitchener being small and it's now a top 10 market. Exactly. Whereas before, if you like 10 years ago, it was not considered. No, the market expanded largely because of tech. And as well, I think the region sort of all morphed into itself. And now it's a big blob of people. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> it's exciting. Lots of competition. Tell me about interviewing. Because there's a level of prep that goes into it. But when we watch you do it, and you've interviewed a lot of famous people, what goes into the preparation for the interview? Because you do make it look easy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, actually. I think that's a really big compliment, making it look easy. And I think with that, maybe why that comes off is because I go into anytime I'm chatting with someone or I'm meeting this person for the first time, but I have to remember that they are just a person. You know, you can connect with them in different ways. You know a lot about them. You have interest in them. So treat them like a regular person and go into it with that, you know, not so much intimidation. Like become their friend or try to be anyways. <laughs> but in terms of prep, 
nowadays you can get so much information about somebody, especially with social media. So, and that's such a good way to relate to someone seeing like, oh, what they've been up to or what they've been posting on their Instagram or nowadays TikTok, whatever it may be, you know, go in and see what they're up to and, you know, create conversations based on that. Obviously do your research to know, you know, they obviously want to talk about or like want you to know about the stuff that they're known for professionally, of course, because they're promoting music or their movies or what it may be. But yeah, I think it's good if you can connect with them by just being interested in them as a person. To me, it feels like you've narrowed the gap really between if I tell you you're going to do a TV interview or you're going to do a radio interview, it almost feels like it would be agnostic for you to approach it, right? Aside from your presentation with you know makeup and a little bit of clothing, the interview feels the same whether it's on the radio and on the television. That's what I get when I hear you. Yeah, I would say so. I guess my question is, as somebody who's just been working with audio forever, how did you narrow that gap? So when I was working in Virgin Radio in Toronto, we did like a lot of videotaped interviews. So we used to have a thing called the Red Room. You know, now they do things a lot differently. There's a lot of things that are virtual and this and that. But when I started in radio, when I started in Toronto, it was a lot of in-person interviews that were taped. And so I guess you just learn to... It's difficult because, you know, you have to make sure you have a presence, this and that. I think it has a lot to do with my acting background, to be honest. You know, I just know how to position myself. I know that, you know, I'm being looked at and you kind of want to have a presence. It's about having stage presence pretty much, right? So I think it takes a lot of practice too, because, you know, when you're interviewing someone, it's different, like having a conversation on camera, because you have to be aware of yourself very much so as you wouldn't be if you were just doing straight audio. So it's just being very aware, being very self-aware, but also not being too self-aware. It's like a fine balance. And I think it just takes practice, to be honest, because obviously, I'm sure my first interview was not as great as ones I've done more recently. So have you been working at Bell since you interned there? No, not not always. Not always. So it was Chum CTV. And so, yeah, when I interned there, then I got my first job in Halifax. So at the time, it was 101.3 The Bounce, which is now Virgin Radio Halifax. So I was there for a couple of years. And I got hired at Virgin Radio in Toronto. And I was there for seven years. So we were up at a building at Young and St. Clair in Toronto. I was there for a couple of years. Then we moved to 99 Queen Street down there. And that's when there was like that merge because we were astral. But at first I was at Chum CTV. When I got hired at Virgin, it was a completely different company. It was Astral at the time. And then they got bought by Bell. So essentially, it's like I have been at Bell this whole time, but not technically. Okay, so I'm not going to edit this part out. There are times I would edit around to try to make this a little smoother, but I think this is a good way to tell people about how the sausage is made for this podcast. And that's, I will go and do research. And I looked at your LinkedIn. And it said you had experience at 101.3 in Halifax at Bounce. And I thought, um, maybe she was voice tracking. And that's what people do now. They'll add the station to their LinkedIn. And I won't know if that's if they move there physically to experience the city or if they just voice track there. So I didn't know that. So you have to tell me all about your Halifax experience. Yeah, I moved to Halifax. I was interning at Chum and I applied and that was the one that I got. And two weeks later, I moved. And like I said, I was there for two years. So I got hired. I was doing, I think, the night show. So at the time, it was 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And it was fun. I loved it. I had never been to Halifax before. I just moved. I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> and I fell in love with it. I actually, it took me a little while at first to, to, to adjust because I was used to bigger cities, obviously Toronto and living in New York. And I would fly to LA every once in a while because I have a lot of friends out there. And so I was like, big cities, you know, I'm like, where are all the tall buildings? But, you know, eventually, once I decided to embrace the city and the culture and everything, I made a lot of friends, I was doing lots of things, working at events, and I just had a really good time. And I loved it. And I love, I love Halifax. Who doesn't love the Busker Festival down there in August? Right? <laughs> and that's a great time slot, too. I mean, between 10 and 2 in the morning... A shift that doesn't readily exist in a lot of places anymore. I mean, how much fun can you have on the radio in a city like that? Yeah, and, you know, and it's funny because I was still learning. It was like my first commercial radio on-air gig. So it was great for me to just kind of test things out and, you know, kind of find my voice, you know, at the time. 
And then eventually I moved to the like the evenings, the 7 p.m. till midnight. And that was my thing for the rest of the time. But yeah, it was fun. It's such a great place. I made so many friends. Yeah, there's some great broadcasters too in that city. I mean, I think you're in the same building possibly as Steve Murphy. Yes, he was my neighbor. I lived right next door to him. <laughs> really? Steve Murphy was my neighbor, yep. I think he was working at Q104 at the time, but somebody like J.C. Douglas, who eventually did go to work at C100, and then a station like C100, which is like the de facto radio station of the city of Halifax since its inception in the 1600s. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you had a good experience there. But did you say you were going from Halifax to Los Angeles at times? Before that, mostly when I was in Toronto, I was going back and forth. And then I did a couple of times when I was there, but it's too far. It's like going to Europe if you're in Halifax. <laughs> it's a long foot. Oh, that's an all day trip. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would go a lot of my friends back from, you know, acting school and whatnot. A lot of them moved out to LA. So that was one of the avenues I was thinking of doing, but I never did. So I would just go visit and spend a lot of time there. Did you look for auditions, voiceover work? What was it in LA? No, I didn't. I didn't do any of Actually, no, I, I did. When I graduated school, I went to the Clear Channel building at the time. And I brought my demo and my resumes and all of that. And I remember I ran into somebody in the elevator. I dropped off my stuff there. And I remember I ran into someone in the elevator. I don't know who he was, to be honest. And after a friend of mine told me, they're like, that was an elevator pitch. That was your elevator pitch. And I was like, what? And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. What do you mean? And they said, you, that was your chance to sell yourself. So apparently, you know, this guy was asking me, you know, what I was doing. And I explained to him, I'm here to drop off my demo. And he said, oh, what are you looking to do? And I think because I was so fresh out of school, I really didn't know what I wanted. I wanted anything. And his advice, advice to me in this elevator, as we're going down however many flights, he said, what you need to do is find that one thing. Find what, what do you want to do? Do you want to be on air? Do you want to do production? Find that one thing and get really good at it. Come back here and do that and say that's what you want. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, I was kind of a little naive about the business at that time. I just graduated school, so... It was an, that was an interesting experience. So I left there feeling like a little defeated, but also, you know, feeling like, okay, I see what's going on. I love how the roots of what you do all go back to performance. And, you know, when I asked about, you know, the difference between television and radio, there's performance. So I'll throw in the voiceover side of it as well, which also dovetails back to your acting. So tell me about your experience doing voiceover, maybe what commercials you've been in and where we can hear you now. That's so funny, actually. I almost forgot, but I was thinking about it today. My very first voiceover gig was when I was 11 years old. <laughs> it was for the show Goosebumps. So I w at the time when I was younger, I also had an agent. So I was, I was in shows like Road to Avonlea and stuff like that, just doing random things here and there. That's significant. Yeah, that is significant. I was only on the last episode. I didn't really have a talking part, but I was in the show. So I had an agent when I was 11 years old in Toronto, and one of the jobs I got was a voiceover job. So it was for the show Goosebumps, and I was literally in there for five minutes. I just had to dub it over somebody, over a scene of me saying, oh, are you going to the party tonight? Sure. Okay. Something like that. Very, very quick, very short. But still today, I'm still getting royalty checks for that till this day. Really? It's not very much, but I'm still getting royalty checks in the mail, which is hilarious. Some people get like checks and the checks are so small, they're smaller than like the price of the stamp to mail them, but it'll still show up. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, like maybe like $10 every year I get something stupid like that, but I'm like, hey, whatever. I guess I shouldn't have really been looking at your LinkedIn. I probably should have been looking at your IMDB. What else am I going to find up there? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe I should make one of those. <laughs> yeah. So in, in terms of like voiceover, I think, you know, that was the start at such a young age. But once I got into radio, that's when my whole career kind of blossomed with everything. You know, most of the things I did were in house, but through working in radio and Virgin Radio in Toronto and being connected to CTV and much music, I was asked to be the voice of Much Music, which I did for about three years, I would say. 
So all the promos you would hear a lot on TV or viewer discretions, all that type of thing, little ads here and there, I would voice those. Also, I think there was like a show called The Launch, CTV's The Launch. I did all the promos for that. A lot of things like that. A lot of stuff was in-house. So once I left Virgin Radio and left all that, I kind of stopped doing that. I also used to voice the stuff for the CTV upfronts, the live shows and stuff. So, which I love. I love doing voice work. It's, it's a lot of fun. How did you handle the pandemic? And, and when you look back at it, how did you approach it? Because if you were in voiceover, you were largely sent home to record. If you were in radio, you were largely sent home to record. You're in television. That's going to be a little bit difficult. How did all that roll out for you starting March 2020? Well, yeah, my career changed significantly. Actually, it changed significantly before that in 20, at the end of 2018, because I was part of Cuts at Bell. So from there on, I started working on personal projects. I I ended up getting like a partnership with Cuisinart, for instance. I just kind of like did a lot of stuff on social media. I was doing a lot of cooking videos, all kinds of stuff like that. Just really just keeping up with the times and staying relevant. And then I was teaching, of course, I was teaching. So that was always good. Once March 2020 came, actually, it's interesting because I started getting the most work that I've gotten during the pandemic, to be honest, which is so rare. And I, you know, I kind of hate to say that because a lot of people did not have such a good time, but I did get a lot of work. So I ended up freelancing for Bell again, once the pandemic started, and I was doing all my radio shows from home. And I've been doing radio shows from home for two, almost three years now. Like I still do some stuff from home. So I got hired for, which is now Move 1057 in Niagara. What was it before? Easy Rock. So I was doing Saturday and Sunday show and it was all from home, my condo downtown. And it was great. It worked well for me. Nobody was going anywhere. I was working. I was back on air. Yeah, it's weird how all that worked out. If you had a studio and you were set up to do anything at home, the work kind of came to you. I know I picked up a lot of voiceover work. I picked up a ton of podcasts. My company radically changed in that period. And it's true. I do have to say, yeah, things were, uh, pandemic was kind of good to me. And it's weird to say while everybody else was scrambling for CERB and and trying to figure out what they were going to do. And, you know, I think people who sang and performed in bars now I found myself hiring them to come on board and to market audio instead of marketing their own audio. It was, it was such a weird time. And I know that so much of the things you do were affected, positive and negative, with the pandemic. So that's why I asked that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. So yeah. And I also started a podcast too, just before that. So it was interesting because I was doing all my interviews in person. And then I had to switch to online. And I'm like, well, I was so worried before. I'm like, about being in person. I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I turn off. You don't want to hear the air conditioner or this and that, you know, to being online to where the quality is not as good as it would be if you were live in a studio. I mean, now things have changed. You can make it obviously a lot better. But, you know, at the time switching, it was, oh my gosh, you know, should I keep going with this? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Everybody's doing it now. So when you went to Seneca, you had an eye on radio. But when people go to take the same course or the course that you're teaching now, do they have an eye on radio? Is radio the first thing they want to do? Or is the course really more multifaceted that includes television and voice and performance and a whole bunch of other things? Yeah, that's interesting you ask that because I've seen such a shift over the years with the students. There's actually quite a few of my students in the past couple of years. Like I haven't been teaching the past year now because I was on mat leave and I had a baby and all that. So I plan to go back and do it because I do enjoy it. But when, you know, the last, I would say, couple years of teaching, some of my students, they were really interested in production to the point of like music production. So they were there in this radio program, but they were making music and producing music with different artists on their own time. So I found it really interesting that they were in this program, but there's a lot of skills they could learn from that program. But the radio program, I feel like, is definitely radio-based. There's a, there's a TV, television broadcasting program that you can go to, so they don't kind of mix it like they would do. I think there's other colleges that they kind of do both, and then you kind of choose which one you want to specialize in, I would say. So this one was just strictly radio, which I think is good. Like if you know that's what you want to do. But I also think it's good to know both because this industry now, a lot of jobs go like TV and radio go hand in hand these days. So 
Aside from what you touched on about them wanting to get in and produce a little bit more music, how are the students of today different than when you were a student? Uh, <laughs> younger. Uh, I'm joking. Listen, you're too nice. And you don't want, and you're not the type of person who wants to stale date or date themselves in any fashion. But there's got to be something in your head that goes, <laughs> that wouldn't have cut it in my day. Yeah, I, I mean, for sure, definitely. I mean, the, the attitudes are definitely different. They're a lot, a lot more entitled in terms of like, there was a couple times where some of the students would be challenging me and what I'm trying to tell them as if they have more experience than me. But I kind of just like shoot that down right away. So <laughs> I don't put up with it really. And I'm not, I'm not like strict or anything. I just won't give you the time of day. Like if that's how you're going to speak about things, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to focus on you because I'm, I'm not teaching high school. I'm here. If you want to be in this program, you're spending money. If you want to be successful, you should probably listen to the person who's teaching you who works in the industry and has been in your position and knows what they're doing. So I just think that for me, I was just wanted to absorb everything. And learn from people who are actually working and doing what I want to be doing. You know, and not all the students, obviously, most of the students were really like diligent in that way where they were there to learn and like just want to know everything that they can. What excites you about the future in this? Because there's so much and you're involved with so much, whether it's, you know, behind the microphone, in front of the camera, with the students. What is it that excites you about the, maybe the next five years about what's coming and what do you see and what makes you go, man, that's going to be exciting? Yeah, I think, you know what, I love how we're all so connected more globally now than ever. And I think the pandemic has really brought that out in a lot of industries because, you know, we're doing so much, so much more online now, more than we would have been doing if there wasn't a pandemic, I think. So I love that, you know, there's lots of possibility for, I mean, all kinds of things, just connecting with, you know, other parts of the world and seeing where things like that could go, because I don't think radio is going anywhere, even though people say that sometimes, but I, I really don't. I think it's just, it's just going to expand into something different. And I don't know, it's exciting. I don't even know like what's going to happen, but I feel like you have to keep going with the times and keeping yourself relevant and keeping up with new trends and new things that are happening in the industry. Otherwise, you're just going to fall by the wayside. <laughs> That's right. Tessa, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.